Hi, everybody. Um, amazing to be at another Creative Mornings chapter uh, here in Auckland. Um, I have done a Creative Mornings talk a few years ago. This was at the Johannesburg chapter. And what I find so incredible about Creative Mornings is anywhere you go in the world, there are people who care for one another and care about creativity. And I want to take a moment to thank the members and the volunteers because I have a real soft spot for member-driven organizations where people do this as a side job, a side voluntary opportunity um, and really for the cause of creativity. So thanks, Laura, for the invitation. Um, at that talk, I spoke about creativity and beyond around how creative people could stretch themselves and really take advantage of the creative economy and what it's like to be uh, in commercial creativity and how difficult it is, how rewarding it is. Um, and then I find myself obviously grown up a bit and brave enough to put the F word in the title of the talk. Um, and this is with apologies to Mark Manson who wrote the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Uh, in this case, I wanted to talk about the art of actually giving it because I think that's where creative communities are so dynamic and so amazing. So I'm here to tell you a story. Um, I'm here to tell you the story of the lockdown collection. This is a story that started on the eve of the 23rd of March 2020 when in South Africa um, President Cyril Ramaphosa, like so many presidents and prime ministers around the world, addressed the nation to say in a couple of days, by midnight on the 26th of March, the country would go into a nationwide lockdown, the likes of which had never been seen, certainly not in South Africa. It was one of the strictest lockdowns on the planet. He gave this address with an impassioned plea to please consider a full lockdown to save the lives of thousands. The next day, it seemed that life would carry on as we all went out to buy toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> amongst, amongst other things. But the day turned into something different for me um, and for a lot of other people. And it started with my co-founder of the Lockdown Collection, one of them, a fantastic Kiwi living in South Africa at the time called Carl Bates. Carl is not in the arts at all. <laughs> he is a businessman, an accountant who had no interest in the arts or art. And when he sat and listened to Cyril Ramaphosa's address the night before, he had his 18-month-year-old baby, Angus, on his lap. And he listened to the president and he said, how is this extraordinary time, 21 days um, of lockdown, ever going to be recorded? How will my son ever know about this extraordinary time in history? And he had a crazy idea. So at 17.52 on this, the 24th of March, Carl sent a voice note to me on WhatsApp. And this is how it went. Just had a bit of an idea that I thought you might like, that we could run um, over lockdown. Something called, or something that we could call something like hashtag 21 days for the future or something like that. And you select 21 up and coming artists that all do a unique piece or whatever you call it, um, related to the lockdown. And ideally most of them would be um, done during the lockdown. And then every day at a particular time, we have um, a live auction of that piece, set at like a reserve price, like 10,000 Rand or 15,000 Rand, something reasonable, but, but not crazy. And the artist gets that. And the rest of it, everything else above the reserve, goes to the COVID-19 South Africa relief effort, whether it's feeding or um, health or a combination of those. And then through your art world, we um, get some partners involved, maybe someone to run the auction, one of the auction houses. Um, the Sadar group could be involved in terms of managing the, the money or the process or the legitimacy or something like that. 
Um, and then we get out the, the media through YPO. I've just done a call with YPO Global um, Media around uh, innovative ideas to support COVID-19 and the relief effort. We get some media out about it and it could get some exposure for their artists, give them a little bit of income during uh, this period and create some, um, expo some great exposure for them as well as create uh, some money for COVID-19. If you're keen to have a chat about it, let me know. <laughs> I mean, he's a CA. <laughs> he's an accountant. Uh, and on his run and during that day, he had pretty much formed this extraordinary idea. Not only did he have the idea, I love how he says, or whatever you call it, like <laughs> no clue about art, like no clue about creativity really, but this incredibly well-formed idea of how could art capture this moment um, of lockdown? How could we have a record? How could we be the record keepers? For this extraordinary time and just remember at this point l like all of us we thought it was going to be you know 21 days and then whoop, we're all going to be out the other side and life is going to be back to normal so i have the reply that i sent carl which just said i absolutely love it so he reached out to me and why did he reach out to me well i am um, in the marketing advertising and brand space um, for a start, and my kind of side interests for years, for side interest, passion, and involvement in both boards and advi advisory roles um, has been within the arts, specifically within visual arts and design. Um, and I, in turn, reached out to my mentor and friend and professor of visual arts at the University of Johannesburg, the extraordinary professor Kim Berman, who runs uh, and started an amazing art collective um, specialising in print work and multiples and young um, at-risk youths into a printmaking process. And I reached out to Kim and I shared this idea of capturing the moment through art. And the three of us literally uh, on Zoom connected and said, could we make this happen? And we decided on some founding principles. And those principles were basically um, what Carl had said, we would reveal an artist or an artwork every day for 21 days. We'd find the artist, we'd beg our friends, <laughs> we'd tap into our network, we'd do what we could. Um, and that the other key principle is that we would have a reserve on every artwork. We all felt strongly that artists are often giving work for charity. That often goes for far less than the value that it should be at. So we had an idea that what if we could do something that had never been done before? We could guarantee the reserves that the artist got the full value of their work at the price that they determined, at the market value price. And we did that by approaching businesses and individuals who were happy to stand for that reserve. So all else fails, the work doesn't sell, artists would get the reserve. The other principle is that we would have an online live auction on the 22nd day. H how would we do this? <laughs> um, we all know what a live art auction looks like. We all knew that um, there were online auctions, but to this point we had no use case of somebody who had combined both. This is now standard practice and we were probably the first um, out of the, you know, first out of the, um, out of the starting blocks on it and it was purely experimental the other thing is would be an open ecosystem we didn't give a shit about galleries about agents we were going to go straight to artists we were going to circumvent any systems to say would you like to participate would you like your work to be part of this historic collection and we agreed between the three of us that health and family came first COVID was the scariest, scariest thing on this day. There was one case in South Africa and I wore my mask 24 seven, <laughs> sanitized my hands to within an inch of their life. Um, and we agreed that we'd look after each other um, and that our families would come first through the process. And the key decision we made was to go big. Carl had said, what about up and coming artists? And we said, no, we wanna go bigger than that. We want to make a bigger story. We want to approach artists, diverse artists from across the divide in South Africa, from the very best 
um, and, and try and hold a, a standard to this collection so it remains historically um, um, relevant and, and actually the participants in the collection would receive value as time went on for the work and the fact that they participated in the collection. So the problem with all of this is we had 48 hours to go. <laughs> um, and 48 hours is an incredibly challenging amount of time, but it is extraordinary what you can achieve in this time. So I did what all responsible adults do. <laughs> uh, I grabbed a drink <laughs> and, um, and I zoomed in to um, my uh, close colleague, um, at the time working for Mrs. Wolf as a full-time designer and creative and I said Tanya we need to develop a holding design for this project. Projects are not taken seriously unless they look serious and they can stand up um, and look as if they're a brand that can stand on any stage. I said we need a logo and a lockup, we need a name <laughs> um, and we need to be live in 48 hours across every platform that's possible. It was, you know, just a basic, you know, <laughs> challenging brief. Um, and Tanya went away and worked her magic and some serendipitous things happened. The name became the Lockdown Collection. Um, at that point, we were the only people who had that name. Just remember, this is the 24th and 25th of March. Nobody was thinking of anything other than masks and toilet paper. <laughs> globally, seriously, globally. Um, and this beautiful um, abbreviation, TLC, um, which was just a serendipitous moment. Um, and of course, the, the device of the lock. And whilst we know that with time, and it's one of my key learnings, that done is better than perfect, as creative people, we're always seeking more perfection. Um, and had we had more time, I wonder how far we would have pushed it, but we were completely happy with where we landed up. 21 days, 21 artists, and 21 impacts. And we set about a design ecosystem that we knew could work across digital platforms and would translate onto all the platforms that we needed it to go. So Tanya and I were very busy on the design branding side um, in these hours of no sleep. And what we also were doing is because we got our socials activated so quickly, we sent out um, a plea. We basically crowdsourced a, a volunteer team. So like your creative mornings <laughs> group, um, we, we managed to, through Twitter and Instagram, a couple of phone calls and some WhatsApp groups, just assemble an incredibly diverse range of people with skills in digital, um, the art world, accounting, uh, SEO, um, uh, and, and everything else that we needed. And so while Tanya and I were busy mostly with that, Carl and his team at the Sodar Group were busy putting governance in place. Um, governance anywhere is important. It's important for legitimacy, it's important for transparency. On the African continent and in South Africa, those are things that we can't take for granted. And we knew from the outset we needed to make sure that everything we generated in terms of funds was auditable, was trackable, and our intention was to pay artists as quickly as we could the minute we got funds in, not waiting for any bureaucracy to, flow, to slow down any flow of funds. And where was Kim? <laughs> well, Kim went to see her longtime associate um, and her mentor, her artistic mentor, who's based in Johannesburg and is one of the most treasured living artists, and that is William Kentridge. And Kim went to William. This was literally at eight o'clock on the eve of the 26th. The lockdown started at midnight. And she went to William to explain the idea to him. And he instantly supported it. And what he also said was exactly what we had intuitively felt. He's like, don't sell these artworks at a bargain price. Sell them at the market value and sell them at the value that the artist determines. Not the gallery, but what the artist determines they would want to get out of it. So we took his advice and what he did for us as well and so aptly called is he donated what we call lot zero 
which was our founding artwork. Where shall we place our hope? was the name of the type of the work that he donated. And within two hours, we had sold this work to an American buyer. And that gave us the starting funds we needed, just for some hard costs, but it immediately gave us funds to start paying out to artists. So this was Lot Zero, and we were theoretically ready to go the next day with our first artist. Now just, um, imagine the chaos that's happening. We worked through the night on this night. We still hadn't decided exactly what the first artwork was going to be. <laughs> we were like in debate. We weren't sure. The artist hadn't given us his bio yet. We were short of the information we needed for the PR. It was, it was just chaos. And Carl, being the businessman and pragmatic guy that he is, eventually got fed up at about 3 o'clock in the morning and he sent this to Kim and I and he said, guys, you can't decide who the artist is. Angus did this at school a few weeks ago, and this, this can be the founding piece. And literally he wasn't joking. So we always say, we give him the same artist credits. It's Angus's work titled Leaf 2020. Anyway, we did finally have our first piece by the academic Gordon Froud, um, and he had become obsessed in the years previous to uh, the pandemic on viruses and he started painting and sculpting viruses. This is a very small one that was our founding artwork but actually he does enormous oversized um, virus sculptures which you can find in various sculpture gardens in South Africa and internationally and it just felt like the appropriate place to start. And through frantic phone calls um, and through being approached by some artists, so day by day, we began to reveal the artworks of 21 incredible South African artworks, artists who were either in process of developing a piece during lockdown or had a piece that they felt resonated with the lockdown theme. So the idea is that this recorded this time in history. So in the early days, artists were not quite done with their piece. Um, and yet we spoke about it and we, we were able to, to create far more noise than we had anticipated. And why was it? We were, well, we were the first cab off the rack. As I said, everybody was panicking about COVID and we were raising funds for artists and putting out beautiful imagery on social media while everything else was doom and gloom. And we, the response from the market and the media was unbelievable and began to fuel this project further and further. And so much so that the news of the project in the art space and in the academic space reached internationally and we started getting support and input um, globally on a, on a global sort of um, on a global stage and this is a group of academics who had started um, a blog over this time called art during quarantine and they were incredibly interested in this project because they'd seen nothing globally in the great art cities of the world there had been no artist response to COVID, no effort um, that was visible at this time um, in order to support artists, those who would most immediately feel the impact of something like a lockdown, absolutely unable to sell works, unable, certainly in a country like South Africa, to set up shop, whether it be on the side of the road or a pop-up gallery. Um, and this kind of response took us enormously, like hugely by surprise. We were just head down and going and the interest just grew and grew and grew, um, which just fueled this fantastic project. And 21 days later, we were ready for our auction, which was called the Unlocking. Um, and we had fantastic speakers. We had people dialing in from all over the world. We had teamed up with a, um, an auction house. And what we decided we would do is we would figure out a way to integrate the online auction system, so bidding online on an online auction system, and we wanted to experiment with Zoom webinars. And through Zoom, you, we would have our live auctioneer and people could bid in the comments, <laughs> um, in the comments section for the work. We're like, let's try it, it's never been done, but let's see if it can work. And so we had this 
incredible unlocking event where we had our 21 works by 21 artists and and so we began auctioning each work off lot by lot and I just thought I'd share with you some of the stories of some of the work we don't have time to go through each of the 21 um, but I just thought I'd just share sort of micro stories about each um, day two <coughs> or lot two was an artist by the name of Linda Zwani. It's just a personal story for me. Um, I've been mentoring uh, Linda, not as his artistic mentor, but as his business and creative champion uh, since he was in second year. This is somebody who walked three hours each way to get to the studio so that he could paint and do printmaking. His mother is a domestic worker. He has no father and he's one of those people who spent his days after school with a stick, you know, drawing in the sand, feeling terrible that he had this gift of being able to draw and not being able to, in his own mind, do anything else. And met an artist one day and realized he could actually potentially do this as a job. Um, and so through help and support, he registered at the Artist Proof Studio and he's, he's had a whole lot of solo shows um, until this date. He's had residencies around the world and he's doing um, amazingly. And he um, was our, um, our second lot. Um, I also love this lot, lot three, uh, an incredible Art Moore Ceramic Art Center in the foothills of the KwaZulu Natal. This artist, Tabiso, he had already had an interest for years in pangolins and would sculpt um, out of clay pangolins. And as we know, pangolins were supposedly the culprit in the wet markets of getting the coronavirus and um, going. And when he heard about the project, he was like, I want to make a work. And, and so he started this work, the pangolin bowl. Um, this is some um, imagery of the bowl in process, um, still not complete. Ardmore is, is really a world famous ceramic house um, and, and his works um, are also around the world. There are people who are fetish about pangolins and, and have collected his work over years. Also fascinated with pangolins um, or, the, or the ancient Uruburus um, as she calls it is the artist Diane Victor. I love Diane's medium. She paints using, well, paints, she creates using smoke uh, on paper. This is created from a flame. Um, and, and her work is, is just extraordinary. And this was really her take on how human beings are eating their own tail. We're actually destroying our, ourselves. Um, I love Colbert Mashile's work. It's so cheeky and, and, so, uh, and so amazing. And when I called him, um, he said, I know why you're phoning and I have a work. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was in process with this work. Um, for him, COVID was like the sneaker coming up um, from behind. Um, he, he's, um, he's just a wonderful, wonderful human being and his work as well. Um, hangs globally um, and then I just thought I'd show you what the interface looked like this is this is the actual this is the auctioneer Ruark uh, he's actually sitting as he confessed to us afterwards with a pair of tracksuit pants on <laughs> and then <laughs> and then his jacket he's an, he's a professional auctioneer from Aspire um, and this is how we interfaced it so you could actually see we were doing bids uh, in, in the chat zone uh, and as well as on the online platform. Um, we also had people raising their hands to say, but I, I want to outbid, um, I want to outbid that. Um, we had people taking telephone bids, uh, but I just thought I'd show you how the interface works. Um, I adore Walter Altman's work. Walter um, creates this, uh, lots of different types of mediums, but this is a, a piece made with metal. Um, it's actually quite a big piece and he worked right through lockdown on, on, on thinking about those who had their hands on the sick and he was really in reverence of um, those working at the, at the front lines um, and taking care of the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers. Um, this piece is, um, was bought by a buyer in Boston and I've seen it up um, on their wall and it's truly, truly an extraordinary um, 
I'd say an extraordinary testimony to those on the front line of COVID. Um, this is a special <laughs> artist to me. Um, he's my cousin, Richard Penn. His wife, Robin Penn, is sitting here. Um, and Robin and Richard are both accomplished South African and now international artists who moved to New Zealand. Uh, Richard um, created these two extraordinary artworks. You can't see them that clearly now. Um, and in fact, two buyers um, were vying for Richard's work. And actually, after the auction, one of the buyers actually outbid the other and uh, landed up um, with those pieces. Um, Richard's um, just completed a residency at um, Auckland Studio Potters and at Driving, Driving Creek uh, in the Coromandel. And I'm sure you'll come across his and Robin's work. This um, is a beautiful piece by an artist called Bambo Sibia. I've also known him since he was really just a young artist off the streets with an incredible talent. And he's also kind of shot to um, fantastic fame. Um, and just um, he saw this as his mother basically waiting in anticipation for him to come home. Um, this fear that people had that they would get sick and would be unable to come home. And this is the moment uh, we're all so happy when Bumbo's work sold. Uh, uh, and, and I just have to mention now, everything sold above the reserves. And what that did, which is why it's such an interesting model to consider, is it released the reserves that people had on the work and allowed them to take the money that they had um, invested or promised to invest and then keep investing further on. So every reserve was broken. Um, and then finally, I, I just love Penny Siopas's bold work, and she was lot 21. Then in the auction, we had a, a, a surprise feature bid. It was a piece by William that he did during lockdown, Torchless Panic. It's basically shut the gate and panic. <laughs> um, and um, and this, <coughs> this was sold for additional funds at the end of the formal auction. So the, the auction itself was what you call in auction terms a white glove sale. Um, they don't happen every day, where everything on the auction sells, and in our case, and then some. We had three or four extra lots which sold as well. Everything sold above the reserve. And when I put this in dollars, it looks insignificant, <laughs> or relatively insignificant. In South African rands, this is um, 2.5 million rand. Um, and millions in South Africa are like millions uh, in New Zealand, the significance. Um, of how far those funds can stretch. Um, so we were really thrilled and just so excited that we'd managed to sort of pull it off. And the team, <laughs> our volunteer team, um, we were just, you know, emotional and kind of quite beside ourselves after that, as were the artists. So what this allowed us to do is the collection of these funds was to set up a vulnerable artist fund, which is what our dream had been was to collect enough funds that we were able to immediately distribute funds to artists who need it, who needed it most. So we set up that fund. Um, we also donated funds to the President's Solidarity Fund, which was supporting all South Africans in need during lockdown. So we contributed a portion of the funds to that. And what we had agreed with the artist is whatever we sold at the reserve was absolutely theirs to have and their payment for the work that they had um, submitted. I have to say that most of the artists donated that amount back to the fund, um, which, which is amazing um, and was certainly not um, expected. And I guess what this did, we thought that was our project done, right? We were, we were done 21 days. But there were a few things that had happened. The, the lockdown uh, didn't end, <laughs> like most places. It was extended for another 21 days uh, and then some. But what this project did is, is it unlocked opportunities we hadn't thought about and we were able to continue to raise funds. And how we did that was we did a next e a collection because 
we went into lockdown for another 21 days. So we we're like, okay, let's, let's keep going. We had a lot of interest and a lot of momentum. So we launched the extension collection not long after. Um, and again, with some incredible South African artists. And this collection also led us then to do even more collections. Um, so over the last two years, we were able to do the extension collection. We did a student collection, um, which was based on a, a theme of sustainability. And we did an open call co uh, collection. And I think what the open call collection was is during the process, we received so many emails from artists saying, we want to give back because we realize that this is a virtuous circle. We realize that if we give, um, then when we're in need, there is this fund to assist us. And so we had received thousands of submissions from artists around South Africa and even internationally to be um, in one of our collections. And that collection became the Open Call Collection. Um, Cynthia is, is a fantastic talent. This is her work in the student collection. Um, this is um, Fani Nani. Uh, his name is Fani Bays, but he goes as Fani Nani. Um, and he is a really beautiful painter, and he was part of the Open Call collection. And I have to mention that my friend Nadine, Ruben Nathan over there, is an owner of one of Fani's pieces from the Open Call connect, uh, collection. Um, and it's hanging right here in Auckland. Um, what we did is, we decided our original intention was to capture the moment, was to capture this time in history, and that the work could be collected as a portfolio. So we had a professionally developed portfolio of the 21 pieces created um, in a limited edition of 25 editions. Um, these sold out immediately, and a couple have already come onto the secondary market uh, selling significantly more than what people bought them for because people recognize the importance of these 21 works as a collection, as a record of time um, of this moment. Um, then, because William remained so close to this project and believed in it, he offered to do a commemorative poster for us of 75 editions to commemorate um, the lockdown collection. And he developed this poster uh, called Way All Tears. And I'll leave William to explain to you about it. Way All Tears is a phrase from a poem by Wilker. He talks about a scale to weigh the tears, but it's the activity of taking, absorbing, and understanding all around, which is obviously one of the conditions of the moment. But there's a series of phrases that I collected. They have very beautiful lapis lazuli pigment, and it's really to use the pigment. So the, this is stop the pigment, find something that connects to the moment or to the question. Obviously, artists like the people who are not in most of of the pandemic at the moment, uh, they're not eligible for all the UIF funds and the flowing and all the other systems, they're really on their own. Sorry, it's glitching a little bit. And then last year, William felt inspired by the, the idea that the pandemic could be coming to an end and moved from the weight of tears to the hope that there is another world that waits us all. Um, and this was the limited edition poster um, or print that William did again in 75 editions. Um, and all proceeds of the sales of these posters goes to the vulnerable and has gone to the vulnerable artist fund. They, they sold out, um, both editions sold up um, within a couple of weeks. And I guess what the story has done is, which was beyond certainly Carl's and mine and Kim's wildest dreams, that it, from an academic point of view, um, from a storytelling point of view, the story was told um, 
in, in art journals, this is an MIT, the MIT summer issue from last year, where um, the academics decided that this was something worth writing about, um, which really kind of humbles me enormously. Um, and just what do people do during crisis? What happens to art? Um, how do we record process and record um, the world through art as really the, the kind of, I always call it like the, the center of social impact. One can always tell the center of social impact through art. Um, and invitations to write about it in business books. How do you have an idea and actually activate it in 48 hours? I mean, we would say that's impossible. You know, how do you basically have a startup in 48 hours? Impossible, um, but possible. Um, business in society handbooks, the global handbooks, we get regular requests to feature the artworks with permission from the artists um, around social impact during COVID. Um, and we've done their last two. And then really the cherry on the top for us was being recognized <coughs> at the end of last year by Business and Art South Africa, which um, I suppose is the qu equivalent of um, arts and culture here as, um, as winners in our categories, our respective categories for contribution to, to the arts. And both Carl's company as a first time sponsor and a first time person ever um, to be interested and activate himself and his company into the arts, which gives hope for us all. <laughs> um, and as well as Mrs. Wolf as the, as the SMME involved um, in the arts, which was just, yeah, just fantastic. Um, and our hope was always that the virtuous circle would always work in coming back to the artists, that they would survive and thrive and their profiles would grow and grow through, um, through the project. And I suppose this is what I want to say the ultimate impact of TLC is, um, is, is not all the media and not all the accolades, but really and truly the amount of money that we were able and have been able to generate um, over and above the initial auction for artists. <clears throat> we still have about a half a million rand um, left to distribute to artists in the fund. Um, these last funds at the moment are going to go towards art bursaries, so to keep students in art programs who are just about to drop out because they can't afford to stay in them anymore, um, or would like to do an art program but don't have the funds to start. And really the comments we got, the letters from artists, the phone calls, the texts, um, is really the joy in the project. And, um, and the idea was that how could we help them thrive at a very difficult time? And in an African sense, this means literally eating and having the lights on. <laughs> and for artists, it means having data so that if you have data on your phone, you can upload your work, um, you can text, um, you can contact your gallery. Um, this was critical. Um, I have to adjust the volume here, but just as, do you want to do it for me? Just, for an <coughs> this was self-created, this piece, by one of the artists we supported. Greetings, Will. I am Mumon the artist. On the dark side, and I create high-quality social paintings, raising awareness about social contentious issues <coughs> in the African continent of your resonate to the rest of the world. Last year on Twitter, I followed Mrs. Wolf and uh, I, I, I took a chance and I applied for the lockdown collection, which is assisting the artists in South Africa with a grant because the COVID-19 pandemic uh, really got in sync. So with that being said, I applied for the grant so that I can create more money and I can sell them. The grant really helped me a lot because I was able to do what I love during the very
I started making sales and also I entered a couple of competitions um, of which I was a bit to quit in India. Um, the very painting that, that you're looking at right now. The lockdown collection grant has played a very important role and I'm very grateful that I'm one of the recipients. Mon Lee um, has continued to perform <coughs> and um, as a really incredible um, artist and yeah, he keeps, he keeps going and that was the intention, is how to keep going. So the six key lessons that I just want to leave you with for me <coughs> and I think generally for creative communities um, to uh, know and understand, although I think we know it intuitively anyway, is that really when there is passion and purpose and crisis, there's usually a creative storm. <laughs> Um, we know this to be true. It's the only way you can get from uh, concept to creation in 48 hours. Um, I think we've all learned this, but EQ skills in both an on and offline world are critical. How to read the room. I mean, the art of communicating online is a skill in itself. <clears throat> and I think we've all learned so much through that, even though we've missed in real life so much too. Uh, I spoke about this before. Done will never be, uh, you know, done uh, will never be better than perfect. But when you're racing to achieve something bigger than that, you learn what to let go of. Um, just an attitude of gratitude. Thank you goes such a long way in a project and such a long way in life generally. Um, your vibe attracts your tribe. Um, I can honestly say that when we put a call out for people to hop on board and work with us, somehow the serendipitous nature of life attracted people who were ready to make an impact and ready to make sacrifices, even though things were very, very difficult for people in their personal lives at this time. And for those of you who are designers and creatives in the room, we know this, but again, it came back to me that design holds ideas together. The idea that Carl had could never have worked if design didn't wrap its arms around the project and give it some gravitas and give it the leverage that it needed to go out into the world and show up. So back to the theme of creative mornings today, I thought how apt that the theme for this month is now. It's around creating urgency um, and the urgency and the energy that comes from, uh, from need and from priorities and from passion. And, and uh, this was really a project about the now. Uh, and so now what? <laughs> well, in New Zealand, even though there is more support and the government has um, basically given the most amount of money in the last two years since, um, since COVID and now um, after the budget to the arts than ever before in history. The reality is most of that money is actually being back paid to events that have been cancelled and priorities that are already passed. Um, and, and yet there is still this extraordinary support for the arts. But after the budget, the minister said this, which I think is just a harsh reminder to us all that it's not over and the arts and culture section will need to adapt to new challenges such as reduced audiences, uncertainty and in financial institution. Like we will never have that sense of, um, of comfort um, that this is all over and we can completely relax. But I think the amazing thing about creative people um, and about creative industry and economies, and this is kind of always the thing that I preach about, is that there has to be support for the arts. Through COVID, it was absolutely and continues to be our therapist. It is the universal therapist, whether you're listening to music, reading a book, watching entertainment, or enjoying visual arts in a gallery space. Um, these are all the things for our minds, for our hearts, for our souls. Um, and a harsh reminder that the world can't do without us and yet the support for us is still at a relative minimum. 
the best we can do is to support one another and to support whatever creative endeavor that we can. And, and I'd still kind of invest every cent and every effort that I make in the, in the power of creativity for true and absolute um, impact. So thank you again, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming.